What is this? What am I doing here? Where am I? I think you're at level one headquarters. I made it. We built a monster. <laughs> it's a monster in every imaginable way. It's more PC hardware than I've ever held in my life. And I got to hold it. He, he trusted me not to drop it. <laughs> we have a static electricity problem at the office I'm still working on. So, I have been, as I've talked about on the channel quite a few times now, and surprisingly getting a good response about, I have been pseudo transitioning or just trying to learn to use DaVinci Resolve from Blackmagic Design as my video editing software, as it has just a brilliant, amazing decode and encode engine for a variety of different codecs that just blows Premiere out of the water. Can confirm the engineering is solid. <laughs> and so we've been doing quite a bit of testing. And one of the use cases that I've seen that I had, I built my own dual Xeon Cineform render server back in 2016. And now certain other channels are trying to put six editors on one computer and things like that is I wanted to see how we could use this because Resolve has its own remote render server built in, which Premiere has mostly stripped out by now, at least for easy access. You can do the Adobe Media Encoder thing, but that's gonna be in a different video. It's a lot more complicated. We have opened it, and it's a lot like when Indiana Jones opened that <laughs> one thing. So we'll, we'll have to do that another time. But I discovered that was in the functionality, started digging in the forums because their manual hasn't been updated for the newer versions. And so I informed them of that politely and started figuring out how we could do this. And so at home, I've built up, which you will be seeing later in this video, my own just kind of low key, what hardware I have laying around render server with a FX9590 and a couple low tier GTX graphics cards. And that's already been really great for offloading some of my rendering to that. But we got to test it even further and see how much it scaled with, we've got a 2080 Ti, 1080 Ti, 1080 Ti, 1070, I don't know, more, more cards than brains. <laughs> more cards than we have wattage. Don't yeah. worry, there's another power supply, it's fine. Yeah, that was interesting. And this is the 2970? WX. WX. Yes. I have not used much Threadripper until today, but I am, I'm, I'm, I'm liking it. So the thing that got me interested was you sent me data and the data for DaVinci Resolve and the hardware that you were running showed that it scaled significantly better than Adobe Premiere, right. both in terms of cores and GPU load. Right. And this system basically confirms that, but it also confirms that DaVinci Resolve has a wall that it hits as well. It's just a little farther out than Premiere. We, made, we went from one tier because going from Premiere on Windows to Resolve on Windows slash Linux, because the render server configuration is actually running on Linux, which I will be doing a separate tutorial slash level one forum post for. Uh, pretty much Resolve would go like half the time Premiere takes to render, even on the older FX chips, which is really old hardware. And I'm I'm maining a i9, like that was insane. And then taking this another step, we got render times down another half or so now doesn't scale for this whole rack of cards. <laughs> so we got it down by half and it's like, okay, let's throw more yeah. hardware at it. And, and then it was just like, no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Pretty much no increase. But this is a really cool situation where if you do have multiple editors going or you just simply need to keep using your computer while you're rendering because I do and my renders will literally keep my cursor from moving, <laughs> you can offload it onto here and queue up multiple renders and even if it does, like even if you use lower end hardware than your editing machine and it takes a little longer, you're still free to do whatever and you can have multiple people sending all projects over to here and handling it, which is a lot more efficient workflow than I see a lot of multi-editor like companies taking on. It does seem like that Resolve will handle the situation of multiple editors sending jobs to a machine to handle it in parallel, but we did not test that. Right. But it does seem like it will handle that better when you move past the first GPU in the render server. Yeah, because we, in, in one of our single to dual GPU render tests, we got a 1% or one, one, one second increase in speed. It, it took one second less. That's, that's <laughs> totally margin of error. <laughs> so, uh... But big requirements, you need a lot of RAM typically. Um, even in my FX build, I have like 32 gigs, maybe even 64 thrown in there. 64 gigs, at least in your editing machines with Resolve, if you're doing 4K stuff, is a must in my opinion. You can go with less in, this, in your render machine if you don't mind it taking a little while, but it will use up all the RAM it can. And we were utilizing uh, Samba shares in Linux for 10 gig network and 10 gig networking for file shares as that way you can set up you know your editing and rendering from the same project whereas in Premiere you have to make sure they're all mapped to specific drive letters 
and make sure that the drive letters line up and it doesn't run on Linux in the first place. We did have a minor performance issue with the 10 gig. The Aquantia NIC oh, yeah. uh, had some kind of a problem with IOMMU. So I ended up disabling IOMMU, which made the Aquantia driver happy. That's actually corrected in a newer version of the Linux kernel. We were using Ubuntu, kernel 4.15. So totally stock Ubuntu. And Sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, and you know, it's fine. And uh, disabling IOMMU resolved the problem, and we were seeing, you know, gigabyte plus speeds over the network, which was nice. Yeah, it it's, was. It's it's, not, it's trickier to do that with 10 gig than most people realize. Even my home 10 gig, which I think is mostly limited by my NAS, but I, I'm excited to see 500 megabytes per second, so that was really cool. But with Resolve, you actually get the option to set up different aliases for your folder shares that are mapped in Resolve. So you can have Mac and Windows or Windows and Linux or Linux and Linux and just have different share names and it will let you read both of them. So if on this computer it's mapped to, if you're editing on Windows and it's mapped to drive X, but it's slash Sama slash public, which is, was here, you can have it read both of those without getting confused and it just, I never had any issues with it once we had the share set up. It was remarkably robust. I mean, the engineering, like the software engineering, so I was on the console looking at like HTOP and thread utilization, and it's like, okay, here, I can see Resolve handed this off to the like X264 library. It's like, okay, I can see that this handed it off to NV Inc, and NV Inc is running on the graphics card and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there is a hack where we can enable multiple streams on NV Inc on consumer graphics cards that NVIDIA doesn't want you to know about. It works great. Ooh. I've actually done that and it's, it's a lot of fun. Did you know they, side note, did you know they dropped that to one chip on 20 series? Yeah. That was, I, I actually had to RMA my, well, I guess it's an RMA, my 2080 back to NVIDIA because they sent it to me to test NVINC and instead of having 50% load for a 4K recording, it was 100%. And they were like, that's not right. And they were like, oh yeah, that's right. There's only one chip now. And I was just like, <laughs> no one told me that. <laughs> no. But Why? yeah. Why you do this? It, uh, you don't need a 2990 or a 2970. A 2950, I think, is the sweet spot for max performance. It's probably not the sweet spot in terms of like performance per dollar, but a 2950 and like a 1080 or maybe a 1080 Ti is fine. Or 2070, 2070 might be the sweet spot yep. for price for performance. I would imagine. And again, you want to prioritize the higher tier hardware for what you're actually editing because the render machine is just doing the rendering and the encoding you want the higher, like if you were to get a 2970WX or something, you'd want that in your editing machine where you're actually playing back in real time. You want that frame rate to be stable or it's okay if you have a secondary render machine if it's going a little bit slower than you would in your editing machine. Like you, you, want, you still want your editing machines to be the most powerful even though we've got. Well, I think until we solve some problems, I think the 2950 is still gonna be the sweet that, CPU in an editing machine because there's still some weird performance things with the 2970 and the 2990 depending on, I'm working on it. I'm working He's on got it. lots I've, of videos. I've about made that. some progress, but yeah. I've still got a ways to go. Because some software is like, I can manage my threads. And it's like, oh, that's good job, Ralph. Don't eat the paste. <laughs> and I will say, on top of how, and I can't emphasize this enough, I know I've said this a thousand times, but how impressive their render engine is. Because if you have never tried it and you need to try it on the studio version somehow, because it's different in the free one. It, it's amazing. But on top of that, the work that they've put in to establish their remote render stuff. Well, while not documenting it or having anyone else showing it off as far as I could tell is really impressive. That's why I wanted to dive in was I was digging through the manual and I saw that these settings were there and they were, like I said, they're not super documented well, especially going cross operating system, but it's very robust. It is super easy to use. And other than nitpicking, configuring uh, PostgreSQL stuff, which, <laughs> PostgreSQL. Yeah, which I fought with for a couple weeks, it just works. Like of all the configurations I have ever done with trying to render on separate machines, which I do a lot because I need to use my computer as soon as I'm done with the project, this has been the most just set up and go that I've ever used. And this is cross-platform, so. It is very impressive what DaVinci has done cross-platform with Resolve. It really, and from an engineering standpoint, it actually is very solid from what I can tell, kicking the tires and trying to figure out how to make it go faster with more CPU cores. Uh, having already done that a little bit with Premiere, Premiere is basically a dumpster fire. And you know, please understand, it's not really Premiere, it's not just Premiere, it's the whole ecosystem of all these plugins. Like, Premiere is really just a platform that all this stuff can be built on. And the platform is not perfectly stable, but then when you add all these plugins that are questionable, <laughs> things get unstable really fast, as you found with a lot of the plugins. Yeah. But Resolve has a much more solid foundation, and there's not as much plugin, there's not as much flexibility yet, but the improvements to Resolve that I've seen the last three years or so 
is shockingly impressive. And the network render thing is really easy to do. I mean, if you make your living doing a lot of video editing, you could set up a render server for a lot of nothing. And you should, because it will transfer. I mean, you can keep working while you're rendering. And just batch, you know, tell a whole bunch to go and batch while you're still gaming if you're into that or what have you. And so, I mean, theoretically with a Threadripper 2990, <laughs> I should be able to do that. I, like I should be able to game and render in the background. You would think. But it doesn't, I mean, you can sometimes in some scenarios, yeah. but it's not consistent. We will have, there will be a full tutorial where I, where I will cover some housekeeping stuff regarding not only setting it up, but some kind of quirks about which combinations of graphics cards you can use and things like that. Um, that will be in the level one forum and probably on his channel as well. And we have a deeper dive into this side of the project because I, I handle the noob tier hardware. Do we want to go over the hardware that we used? Sure. We get the Be Quiet case. I don't remember what model this is. This is the Darkbase Pro 900 Revision 2. I have actually the Darkbase 900 coming in to replace for my main rig, so I'm excited because building, or seeing, he, he did most of the building, but seeing you know how much space is in here, I'm actually really excited for this case. We've got the Intermax 360 millimeter radiator with Noctua fans in the top. We have the ASRock Fatality uh, motherboard. It's got built-in 10 gig, but it also has four, X, uh, four PCI Express slots, X16, X8, X16, X8. And this case has you know the full eight expansion slots at the back. So even though you know some cases you wouldn't have room for that last video card, but on this one you do, and we can run four graphics cards off this motherboard, no problem. It even has extra PCIe power input. Just with a little bit more. Yeah, you're gonna need like a 1400 watt power supply to get it done. Especially with the 2970 or 2990, I mean, with the precision boost overdrive, 350 watts, uh, this thing, <laughs> yep, that's how that thing is just completely nuts. We've got 64 gigs of error correcting memory, it's overclocked to 2933, 1.35 volts. I mean, it's overclocking ECC memory, <laughs> but it's fine, basically, and you know, I can do that. I don't know if I'd recommend that for you guys. Um, and then we got an Antec. Uh, you know, high current gamer, 850 watt power supply. We need like 1200 watts to 1500 watts for this many GPUs. Uh, we've got uh, NVMe storage and SATA storage and we can add, you know, more stuff even beyond that. So it's really not a complicated system. It's pretty much paint by numbers. It's, you know, anybody could build this. Yeah, and with a case like this, I think I mentioned it in the other video, this one has like six to 10 drive bays for three and a half inch drives, which means you could make a combo all in one NAS storage server, render server, you know, everything all, especially if you get one of those high core count CPUs, you can map it all out and just have this one thing do everything. Yeah, that's when we were using the Windows workstations to feed this, this was the file host, but with its 10 gig ethernet, we were seeing a gigabyte per second read and write speeds. It's so beautiful. it was great. <laughs> Well, thanks for watching. Make sure you uh, go check out our videos over on the Level 1 Techs channel. Thank you for Wendell for helping me out and answering when I banged on the door begging for hardware support. Thanks for help because <laughs> I don't, I get sucked into the crazy and then I don't, and the six months has passed and I don't know what's happened. But hey, solving puzzles. I'm all yeah. about solving puzzles. And this was really good timing too because he's been doing a lot with the regression, performance regression with the 2990WX and Windows kernel management and things like that. And that kind of paired in with a lot of issues I've been having. So. This kind of really worked out. Links will all be in the description below once we figure out where things are going. I'll also say that Resolve seems to work really well on both Linux and Windows. So like even though Windows is Windows, Resolve works well in terms of like render time yep. and not bottlenecking and not doing weird stuff on both platforms. So that's encouraging. Even, even with, which we talk about in the Premiere video on this channel, I really want you guys to go watch it because I complain about this all the time. Even with Red Giant plugins, they exist on Windows for Resolve. They don't have Linux support right now. But there was one time I got an error message from Resolve saying out of GPU memory, can't do anything else, please close. <laughs> Actually, it wouldn't even let me close it. It's just like, can't save the project, help. Um, but otherwise, it will slow down when it's using those plugins and it's running out of memory, but it handles it. it it's stable. It is. This has been, when configured right and when on the right distribution of Linux, or just on Windows, it has been some of the most stable video editing software I have ever touched, which is weird. <laughs> Premiere is not stable anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's just not. Premiere is optimized for like a four core MacBook Pro. And, that, and beyond that, no one cares. Yep. And that makes me sad. Yeah. Cause you can t like, you can like, I'm not just saying that. I'm saying I opened the hood and literally it's it's a hamster who's, <laughs> who's, who's getting real tired of your crap. <laughs> and that's what is basically running Premiere. But I mean, the hamster is great running on a four core MacBook Pro or a six core MacBook Pro, but 
If you've it got a real a computer. Little buddy. Yeah. Well, look at the iPad. You know, the iPad was a really interesting thing. The iPad, the iPad Pro does a lot of stuff in silicon, in hardware, and it will do a better job editing 4K video than the 13 inch MacBook Pro. And that sounds like, oh, whoa, did he just, I mean, was there, was there, you know, was, <laughs> there's some equivocation there, right? I mean, come on. Not from the stuff I've seen, like it's. Yeah. One to one, like people will copy over their red footage and there's been quite a few videos where it's just, obviously the software on there is more limited and the user interface is an iPad and heat management is Some people attribute that to ARM. It's not ARM, it's that the silicon and the software were designed together. And the silicon does exactly what it's supposed to do and the software does exactly what it's supposed to do. The problem with that is that when the silicon is outdated, there's nothing you can do. So if a new codec comes along or a new whatever, you're stuck. Which we saw for quite a few years there with DVD players and Blu-ray players whenever all the new MPEG things came out. You could have the fastest computer in the world. If you didn't have the MPEG chip in your computer, you couldn't play a DVD. I don't want to go back to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out there's a reason it's, it's software. That, that story is maybe a conversation yeah. for another day, but uh, it is shockingly impressive what you can do when you have purpose-built silicon. And it is a little surprising that there's not more of an alignment on our purpose-built silicon in both our CPUs and our GPUs and the software. And I think that it's more on the software engineering side than the hardware because we've got AVX 512, we've got NV Inc, we've got a lot of really cool stuff in both the GPU and CPU silicon that frankly is not being used by most software yet. I mean, the algorithms are more complicated, but they're getting there. There is, a, this is pure speculation and I'm not gonna tell you to go buy hardware because of ray tracing basically, which doesn't has exist yet and all of that. But Blackmagic has stated very confidently that they are working and they are going to utilize the tensor cores on RTX cards and they have figured out some way to make it work really well for them. And I am super stoked for that. We have literally, they literally would give no other information, so it could be snake oil. But I imagine there's a couple plugins specifically for Resolve that I have been using a lot, which are like face tracking and analyzing to just apply effects to your face. And some of the stuff that they do in eSports with the tensor cores, I imagine they could offload that on there. So there, you could see a lot of really unique speed ups in Resolve and software that actually wants to take advantage of it if they make it happen. Don't go buy a 2080, just some speculation, but pretty cool. That being said, Adobe still hasn't even implemented Envy Inc. So uh. <laughs> we just got QuickSync support this year. All right, that's enough rambling. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye.